Hi everyone. <clears throat> I know it's been a while, but I'm back. Um, a lot's gone on here, but um, let's continue with Let the Circle Be Unbroken by Mildred Taylor. We are on chapter four. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Okay, now I can read it. Please forgive my crazy hair. Winter came in days that were gray and still. They were the kind of days in which people locked in their animals and then themselves, and nothing seemed to stir but the smoke curling upward from clay chimneys and an occasional red-winged blackbird which refused to be grounded. And it was cold. Not the windy cold, like Uncle Hammer said swept the northern winter, but a frosty, idle cold that seeped across a hot land ever looking toward the days of green and ripening fields. A cold that lay uneasy during its short stay as it crept through the cracks of poorly constructed wood wooden houses and forced the people inside, huddled around ever-burning fires, to wish it gone. Through these days, the boys and I continued to trudge to school, and once there, to scramble for one of the two pot-bellied stoves which warmed each building. After putting in our eight hours, we trudged home again. Uncle Hammer, Papa's older brother, came Christmas Eve, but the day after Christmas, he was gone again, unable to stay longer. Papa and Mr. Morrison filled out their days with winter chores, mending tools and making new ones, and on milder days, stringing fences and chopping wood, and talked of spring in the fields. Big Ma, who enjoyed every season, settled down to her winter quilting, spreading out the pieces of her pattern by the fire as soon as breakfast and the morning chores were finished. To sew and talk with other women of the community until it was time to put supper on. As for Mama, she had her students to keep her busy. Since the school year had begun in the fall, little Willie and Clarence had been stopping by afternoons to ask Mama's help. Now the number of students who came by daily after school had grown, and Mama practically ran a school after school. And she loved it. While the weather was still good, she often sat right on the front lawn with her legs folded beneath her. Her students gathered around. Now in winter, they filled the sitting room area in the hour or two they could snatch before attending to their evening chores, as Mama patiently explained what they did not understand. On Saturday, she actually taught lessons of her own, in addition to reviewing the lessons of other teachers. And frankly, I was somewhat amazed by how many students sacrificed a morning free of school to come. As January became February and February mellowed toward March, the boys and I looked forward to the last day of school, which would come at mid-March. School usually ended at this time so that students could return to the fields for spring planting. Had the school year extended any longer, classrooms would have been empty for cotton sustained life. And no matter how greatly learning was respected, the cotton had to be planted, chopped, weeded, and picked if the family was to survive. Few parents expected their children to do any work other than what they and their grandparents had done, and education was usually sacrificed if a choice had to be made between it and the fields. Students knew this and understood it, and because they knew nothing else, for the most part, did not resent it. But there were some boys and girls, like Mo Turner, who thought, though they did not know what else they could do outside of farming, they knew that they did not want to spend their lives sharecropping, and each year they planned their escape from it. We gonna make it this year all right, Mo said for the third year in a row as we walked from school. I mean it, I mean it this time, Papa and me, we figuring on planting 10 acres in cotton. Crop come good, we can get off old man Montier's place. 
my comment to that ridiculous statement was, Boy, you know good and well y'all ain't hardly gonna. Cassie, would you hush? I cut my eyes at Stacy and grew silent, not out of any resignation to his so-called authority, but because I figured if he wanted to let Mo continue to delude himself about this sharecropping business, then that was up to him. Yet he knew as well as I did that there was little chance of Mo's family going anywhere at the end of cotton picking. The Turners had sharecropped on the Montier Plantation since the 1880s, and it was less than likely that one good crop would free them from doing the same for another year. As sharecroppers, they were tied to the land for as long as Mr. Montier wanted them there. Mr. Montier provided everything for them, their land, their mule, their plow, their seed, in return for a portion of their cotton. When they needed food or other supplies, they bought on credit at a store approved by Mr. Montier, where high inter interest rates upped the price tremendously on everything they bought. At year's end, when all the cotton had been sold and the accounts were figured by Mr. Montier's, Montier, the Turners were usually in more debt than they had been at the beginning of the year. As long as they were in debt, they could not just up and leave the land on their own, not unless they wanted the sheriff after them. And here Mo was talking about earning enough to quit sharecropping. It was pure foolishness. And if I knew it, Stacy had to know it too. Nevertheless, a quiet rebuke of me welled from not only Stacy but Christopher John and Little Man as well for having said anything. Mo, however, continued his trek seemingly unaffected by my words. In deep thought, he walked mechanically along the road, taking no notice of me. Then, when I was beginning to think that Mo's sharecropping hallucinations had been completely dispelled by my remark, he said, I know y'all think we can't do it. Now, Mo, I ain't said that, objected Stacy, and you can't pay no attention to Cassie here. I shot a hostile glance at Stacy's way. Anyways, I know it's hard, continued Mo, times being like they is and all, but I figure them times been hard all my life. Now, don't seem so much worse than any other. Like I told my daddy, we got as much chance of making it this year as any other I seen. You ain't seen but 14, I pointed out. What'd your daddy say? Stacy asked. Mo waited a moment before he answered. Said he'd give up trying to make it. Said he'd give up long ago. All he care about now is seeing us young'uns growed and off that place. Stacy stooped to avoid the low-hanging branch of a sweet gum tree and breaking off a twig, stripped it down and chewed on it a moment before turning again to Mo. I ain't saying you can't do it, Mo. Papa say you can do just about anything you set your mind to do. You work hard enough. But you can't never tell about cotton prices. For the government program, we weren't getting more than six cents a pound for good long staple cotton. And even with the government stepping in and we getting some 12 cents a pound last year, but you can't never tell about what it'll happen between planting time and picking. Then, too, you know, with the government restrictions, you can't plant as much as you want to. Mo's gentle features settled into firm lines of determination. Gotta get out, he whispered hoarsely. Gotta. Stacy and I both stared at Mo. Usually such a level-headed boy, he was totally illogical when it came to the subject of sharecropping. Yeah, Stacy sympathized. I know. No, you don't, Mo said quietly. Y'all got y'all's own land. There was no bitterness in his voice. He was only stating the truth. Stacy nodded, still chewing on his stick. Then he said, Look here, Mo. You thought about what if you don't? I mean, besides a low price of cotton, there's all the de 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 deducts to figure and understand you can't never tell about them. 
Mo sighed heavily as he considered the reality of the deducts. The credit charges made by a sharecropper during the year which could wipe out all the money earned before the cotton seed had ever even sit the, hit the ground. Don't care about no deducts, he said impassively. We gonna get out anyway. I'll get me some WPA work if I have to. Maybe even the CCC. WPA? I questioned, looking for Mo to Stacy. What's WPA? Don't know if you get any money on the CCC, Stacy said. I said, I said, what's WPA? I knew what the CCC was. Civilian Conservation Corps. Stacy and other boys in the area had certainly talked about it enough. Another one of Mr. Roosevelt's programs. It trained boys in agriculture and forestry methods, and several boys from the community had gone to join it. Stacy had even wanted to go, but he was too young, and besides, Mama and Papa wouldn't have let him go anyway. But I didn't know about this WPA. Well, what is it? Stacy sighed at my persistence. Mama say their projects are something President Roosevelt's setting up to give a lot of folks jobs. Works Progress Administration, I think she said. That hospital they're talking about building on the old Huntington Place, that's one of them. He turned from me and asked of Mo, You leave this place and go off alone? You do that? Then what's your daddy gonna do? Leave it, Mo repeated incredulously. Leave it? You doggone right I'd leave it. Leave it in old man Montier and that's nothing son of his too. A mean scowl burnt across Moe's usually pleasant face. You know what that old man done the other day? Told me I ought to quit being so selfish and leave school and stay home and help my daddy. Said he thought I'd gotten just about all the schooling I needed to be a farmer. Like I care what he thought. Mo frowned deeply, had it in his mind that whatever he was going to turn out to be, it wasn't going to be a farmer. For the last four years since he had finished the fourth grade school near Smellings Creek, he, along with a few other boys and girls, had walked the three and a half hour distance to school each day, leaving their homes before dawn and not returning until after dusk. Most boys and girls who attempted the trek gave it up after a year, but not Mo. Mo was determined to finish 12th grade and get his high school diploma. And if Mr. Bastion Montier didn't understand that, then that was just too bad. You tell your papa what Mr. Montier said, asked Stacy. Mo shook his head. I just told Mr. Montier I wasn't planning on being no farmer and I needed my schooling. Stacy eyed Mo. You best watch what you say. Mo gestured wildly. I ain't said nothing but the truth. I ain't gonna go talking out a ton of nothing. You think I wanna get us all killed? But I tell you this one thing, I'm gonna get us some money and get us off this place any way I have to. I'm tired of them Montiers, and I ain't about to let these folks down here do me the way they done TJ. Mo stopped abruptly and glanced around self-consciously. Christopher John, Stacy, and I avoided his eyes, but little man stared directly at Mo in silent accusation before looking away into the forest. Since Mr. Jameson had come a few weeks ago and told us his appeal for a new trial had been rejected, we had spoken very little of T.J. It was too painful. Mo, having said too much and knowing it, continued along the road in silence. As we neared the crossroads where he would leave us, he started to speak again but stopped as a car appeared in the crossing, coming up from the north. The driver saw us, waved, and stopped the car. Speak of the devil, sighed Mo. Lord, what he want? Driving the car was Joe Billy Monty. His sister Selma sat beside him. Joe Billy rolled down his window as we approached. Hey, Mo, he said, then nodded toward the rest of us. How y'all doing? We said we were fine. 
You on your way home? Joe Billy asked of Mo. Yes, sir, answered Mo as he was expected to. I just picked Miss Selma up at Jefferson Davis and we going home now. You want, you can get in. Miss Selma was no more than 14. Joe Billy looked to be 18 or so. Mo looked directly at Joe Billy. I gotta stop somewhere else before I go home. But thank you kindly anyways. I knew Mo didn't have anywhere to go but home. I think Joe Billy knew it too, but he only nodded and rolled up his window. Gas in the Ford, he sped away. At least he offered you a ride, I said. Aw, oh, Joe Billy's all right most of the time, I guess, Mo conceded. It's mostly his daddy I can't stand. We said goodbye to Mo, who would follow the Granger Road as far north as Soldier's Road, and from there turn westward toward his home, which was just this side of Smellings Creek. It would be bark dark by the time he got there. When the boys and I arrived home, we found the country extension agent, Mr. John Farnsworth, talking to Papa in the driveway. Both Papa and Mr. Farnsworth nodded as we came up, then continued their conversation. Now, David, said Mr. Farnsworth, I know how things were for y'all in 33 when y'all signed up, but it was a new program then and a lot of things went wrong. I figured the government should have waited until 34 to begin their crop reduction program instead of plowing up cotton ready for picking in the middle of the 33 and leaving it to rot in the fields. And I ain't like that any more than anybody else. The boys did not stopped at the well to get some water, an excuse to listen further. But I ain't had nothing to do with that. That decision came from Washington, Mr. Farnsworth sighed and glanced out to the west field, already planted in corn. And David, I ain't got, ain't had nothing to do with that check business either. Papa only looked at Mr. Farnsworth and said nothing. The boys and I waited, knowing too well how to put out Papa, how put out Papa was with the government's crop reduction program. Although I found the government's program confusing and, un and understood very little about it, one thing I did understand was that the government had asked us, along with all the other farmers, to plow up nearly half of our cotton two years ago. Cotton already planted and blooming in the fields, and they were supposed to pay us for it. Well, they had paid us all right with a government check. The only problem was that Harlan Granger's name had been on it. Mr. Granger had claimed he held a first mortgage on our cotton crop, and as Mr. Farnsworth explained it later, the government's policy was to list the first mortgage holders as co-payees on the checks, so they would be sure to receive any money owed to them. Of course, Mr. Granger had never held a mortgage on our crop, but since it was his word against ours, it seemed useless to fight him. As for the check, there was no way for us to cash it without Mr. Granger's signature, and if Mr. Granger signed, part of the money would go to him. So. Papa, Mama, and Big Ma had decided not to sign the check at all, and Harlan Granger hadn't pressed them to sign. After all, it wasn't the money he wanted. He just wanted us. He didn't he just didn't want us to have it. Now I know what you thinking, said Mr. Farnsworth. I'm the one brought you the check to endorse, and I'm the one representing the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. Well, that's both so, but the truth of the matter is, all the people that signed for the program had to list everybody had a lien on their cotton. You remember that? I remember, Papa said. I remember, too, I ain't put Harlan Granger's name on that contract. Well, he come up after you signed and said he had a lien. I had to put his name down. Papa was silent. Again, Mr. Farnsworth glanced away. Thing is, I had no idea the government was going to issue the checks like they done, made out to the signer until anybody had a first mortgage on the signer's crops. 
It was my understanding the check was supposed to go to the farmers to give them some relief. Well, said Papa, that ain't what happened. Mr. Farnsworth nodded before going on. Now last year you all didn't join the program and you planted as much cotton as you wanted. But what did it get you? You lost over a quarter of your crop anyway. If you'd been part of the program, then you would have at least had the money the government would have paid you for not planting all your cotton acres. I don't see it that way. Well, I told you I would have made sure Mr. Granger's name wasn't on the check this time, even if he made the claim again. Anyway, it's done with now. Nothing we can do about it. Last year's contract was for 34 and 35 so unless you want to sign for this year now, you won't have to worry about a contract. But you are going to have to worry about the new cotton tags. I glanced over at Stacy. He kept his eyes on Papa and Mr. Farnsworth. The government's going to have its way on this thing, David, and there ain't nothing you or me or anybody else much can do about it. He turned back to his car. You've got the tax exemption forms there so you can put in for your bail tags. You'll need them to show how much you're allowed to grow when you take your cotton to market. At the car, he hesitated and looked again at Papa. You know, David, I don't like these restrictions any more than you or most anybody else. Wish the government had just hired agents of their own to do this restricting business and let us extension agents do what we was hired to do. Help you farmers with your crops. But most folks didn't, don't seem to understand that. They blame me for everything that's gone wrong. He looked at Papa as if wanting to his understanding. Then he got in the car. See you next week, he said, and backed out of the drive. As Mr. Farnsworth headed east on the road, Mr. Granger's sleek silver Packard came from the other direction, and the two cars stopped. Papa watched them a moment, then crossed to the well. Can I get a little, little of that, too? he asked. Sure thing, Papa, said little man. He filled the dipper with fresh water and handed it to him. Papa, this here cotton tax, I said. What that mean? Before Papa could answer, Stacy laid a hand on his shoulder and nodded toward the road. Look like Mr. Granger's coming up here. We all stared at the Packard, keeping our eyes on it. Of the four major landowners in the area, the others were the Monteers, the Harrisons, and the Walkers. Harlan Granger had the largest holdings and was the most powerful. He was accustomed to getting what he wanted, when he wanted it. And one thing he had long wanted but had not gotten was our land. The Packard sped up the road and slowed at the driveway. Mr. Granger honked his horn, summoning Papa. Papa stared at the car, then finished his water and gave the dipper back to little man before going down. The boys and I waited until he was halfway to the road before following him as far as the mulberry bush. David? Mr. Granger? Just seen Mr. Farnsworth on the road, said he'd been, just been here to see y'all. That's right. He told me he spoke to you about the government's tax. He did. You know why the government had to do that, don't you? To keep folks not under contract from planting as much cotton as they feel like and making more money than folks done join the program. He stared pointedly at Papa. This tax is an understandable thing when you look at it right. After all, how are we going to keep prices up if folks keep glutting the market? You and me both know prices will fall to six, maybe five cents again. Mr. Granger waited as if expecting Papa to say something. When Papa didn't, he added, It's for the good of everybody. So I understand, Papa said. Good. You know, David, I like you. You run foolish sometimes, but far as I can see, you got a streak of sense in you, and I admire that. What I'd like to do is help y'all out. Now, we done had our differences, and I gotta admit, you done riled me good several times. Both you and Mary, and your mama too. But y'all done a good thing for me last summer, 
keeping that fire from spreading across to my place, and I ain't for God. Now, I know y'all need money, so I'd like to help y'all out if I can. Maybe pay your taxes, and y'all can pay me back when y'all can. Papa tilted his head slightly at the offer, but he said, Well, Mr. Granger, I thank you kindly for your offer, but we always take care of our taxes ourselves. Well, I'd be glad to. Wouldn't have offered otherwise. Like I said, thank you. Mr. Granger's eyes met Papa's. He smiled again. All right, David. But you change your mind. You let me know. Don't expect I'll be changing it. Well, you never know. Mr. Granger shifted gears and Papa stepped back from the car. By the way, you hear tell of a union man talking to anybody down in here? can't say that I have. Heard there was some socialist up organizing around Vicksburg. He shook his head. Hope that rottenness don't come down in here. That's a nasty business, that union, and no good will come of it. He pulled into the drive and turned around. One other thing, David. You find you don't need all your bail tags? I'll be glad to take them off your hands. Pay you a good price for them. Don't forget my offer now about your taxes. Be glad to help. Anytime. The boys and I went over to Papa, standing motionless, watching the rolls of dust as the car sped back up the road. Papa, how come Mr. Granger being so nice? I asked. Nice? Yes, sir. Offering to pay our taxes and all. <laughs> Papa laughed. I shot him a puzzled look. <laughs> Listen, sugar, he said, putting his arm around me. You boys, too, and remember, any time that man offers something, you just look to see how he gonna gain from it. But, Papa, how could he? asked Stacy. He be putting out money. Cause, Stacy, he pay our taxes, and his name will get on our tax record. And then one day he could put in his claim against our land. Could take it to court. And the land maybe could become his. Stacy and I looked at each other. Papa nodded. That's a fact. Most likely figured I didn't know. He put his other arm around Christopher John's shoulders. And we headed back up the drive. Something else to remember too. Gotta always stay. One step ahead of folks like Harlan Granger. Two, if you can. At the entrance to the backyard, the boys and I turned toward the house. Christopher John and Little Man ran noisily down the porch and into the kitchen. But Stacy lingered a moment by the entrance, then ran after Papa, who was headed toward the barn. Curious, I followed. Papa, about this tax Mr. Fonsworth mentioned. What was he talking about? Papa looked at Stacy and took a moment before he answered. Bad news, son. That's what it is. The government's going to charge us 50% tax on all the cotton we grow, above what they figure we ought to be growing. But we ain't got no contract. We don't have to grow what they tell us. Looks like we do now, son. Like Harlan Granger said, this here is to keep everybody following the government's program whether they got a contract or not. <coughs> but a 50% tax? Pop at 12 cents a pound, that means we'd only be getting 6 cents a pound. That ain't hardly worth the trouble of planting. A wry smile edged Papa's lips. That's what the government figures. I came closer. Papa, I don't rightly understand all this tax and contract business. Papa looked my way. Why don't you understand, sugar? I frowned. Well, the whole business, the government program, the contracts, and now this here new tax. Well, it ain't actually, ain't exactly a new tax. Government put it on last year after we'd already planted. But we didn't feel it because we'd lost so much of our cotton to the fire. But I know it's confusing, all right. He glanced out toward the walnut tree standing at the edge of the backyard near the garden. Come on, 
Let me see if I can clear it up for you. The three of us walked over to the tree and sat on the bench under it. Now you know we into what folks are calling a depression. I nodded. I knew that well enough. I had been hearing about it most of my life. Well, with this here depression, prices fell way low on a lot of things. Corn and potatoes and hogs fell on cotton, too. Fell to five and six cents a pound. And that's way low? That's way low. Papa shook his head and smiled. Back in 1919, that was the year I met your mama. Prices for cotton got up to 35 cents a pound. Did? Papa nodded. But right after that, prices started falling, so come this here depression. Cotton prices were already low, and they just hit bottom with this five and six cents a pound. And that's when Pro President Roosevelt come in, said Stacy. I shot him an irritated glance. Papa's telling this. He's right, Papa said. Back in 33, when Mr. Roosevelt became president, this here Agricultural Adjustment Administration, the AAA, I said, that's right, it come into being and the folks on this AAA figured that the way to get prices up again was to cut back on the amount of cotton grown and put on the market. Reasoning was that when something's scarce and more people want what's left, then folks will pay more for it and prices arise. Papa smiled at me. Exactly. Well, the government figured that they had to get their program started right away. So they come around in the summer that same year, 33, and they asked all the cotton farmers to plow up part of their crop. And it was already blooming. I remember that. It was blooming all right. Looked to be a good crop. But the government figured it couldn't wait so that to get folks to plow up their cotton. They said they'd pay everybody for the acres they plowed up. And that was in the contracts, Stacy interrupted again. This time I didn't say anything to him and Papa went on. Anyways, the contract sounded pretty good. But then you know we signed just like just about everybody else. Like just about everybody else. And you know what happened? Harlan Granger's name was on that check. I nodded, remembering. The next year, 34, the government come out with a new contract. Said they'd pay folks not to plant. Said if folks didn't plant some 35 to 45% of their acres, they were used to planting in cotton, then they'd pay them so much per acre. For 35, they wanted folks not to plant some 25% of their cotton acres. Said, though, they could plant crops to improve the soil or crops for use just on the farm. It all sounded good. But we decided we'd better not sign up again because of that check business. Yes, sir. I, I was thoughtful for a moment. Mo said their government check goes straight to Mr. Montier and he take all of the money. Papa shook his head at the injustice. Folks cropping like the Turners and Miss Lee Annie and the Ellis's things are even harder for them now than they were before the government stepped in. They hard on us too, don't get me wrong, but on cropping folks, well, it's really bad. A lot of that money that, money that was supposed to go to them been ended up in the pockets of the landlords. Landlords claim the government money belongs to them because of the credit they give to folks cropping their land. Claim all the people cropping on their places owing money, and some of them, I guess, are telling the truth on that. Still, there are some of them, these landlords that are making a nice, tidy sum from the government and the AAA when they shouldn't be. When they oughtn't be. No, mi no wonder Mr. Granger can afford a new packet, I surmised. Papa laughed. So did Stacy. <laughs> That's a fact, Papa said. Then he stopped laughing. Thing is, though, while Harlan Granger and the like are getting this government money, folks that are supposed to be getting part of it, too, are having hard times. They're planting less and getting nothing in return. 
A lot of them are getting put off their farms because the government wants to cut back so much on the number of cotton acres planted. Harlan Granger and the rest take the government money and just put a lot of folks off the land to cut back on the number of their acres planted. Ain't supposed to, but they do anyways. Then, come picking time, they use day laborers. I looked at Papa, and that's how come we see so many folks with all their stuff piled on their wagons. They've been put off their land. It's a crying shame. But they got no place to go. I heaved a heavy sigh and looked out over the land. But that won't happen to us. Papa's eyes followed my gaze. Not as long as I have anything to say about it, Cassie girl. I glanced around and saw Stacy nodding in silent affirmation, as if Papa's words went for him to do. Still, the same worried look was on both their faces. Know what I heard, said Christopher John, smiling broadly as we started off to school next morning. What? asked Little Man. Christopher John looked from Little Man to Stacy to me and Beam. Papa ain't going back to the railroad. I stopped. I ain't? That's what I heard, ain't that something? Stacy looked at him wearily. Where do you hear that? Papa or Mama tell you? No, but I heard them talking this morning off the back porch. Mama said, David, I don't want you to go back to that railroad. And then Pop said, well, sugar, I don't want to go back neither. How about that? Christopher John then grinned with happiness as Stacy, little man, and I stared at him waiting for him to go on. Well, I said finally. Christopher John looked puzzled. Well, what? Well, what else? Nothing. They seen me and they didn't say nothing else. Oh, shoot, boy, I exclaimed. Papa not wanting to go back. Don't mean he ain't going to go back. I walked on in irritated frustration that Christopher John's news meant nothing. For three years now, since the cotton market had gotten so bad, Papa had been going to Louisiana each spring. From there, he traveled on to Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, and Texas, repairing the laying railroad repairing and laying railroad track. He had been lucky to get the job, and because he was a good, dependable worker, he had kept it as well. But then last spring, he had been shot and his leg broken in a run-in with the Wallace brothers. He had not been able to go back to the railroad. The money he would have earned was sorely missed. Yet, despite knowing how much we needed the money, I was glad Papa had stayed home, and I didn't want him to go again. But Stacy, don't it mean he's thinking about not going back? Christopher John asked undaunted. Stacy sighed. He thinks about it every year, Christopher John. Don't you be thinking he want to go away? But there's the property taxes and seeding and farm tools to pay for. And the cotton, it just don't bring in enough to pay for everything. We need that railroad money. For several minutes, we walked in silence. Then Christopher John, ever hopeful, said, What about if Papa got another job close to home? That ain't likely. You know he looked for and ain't no work around here. Well, I sure wish he could stay on home and not go back to that railroad no more. Me too, put in little man. I said nothing else, and neither did Stacy as the four of us continued solemnly towards school wondering if this would finally be the year Papa would really stay. From the second crossroads, we could see the Jefferson Davis School some distance in the north, to the north. It was there that white children attended school. Farther down at the next crossroads was the Wallace store, where much of TJ's trouble had begun. We glanced down the road, then hearing the great faith warning bell quickened our steps. Once on the school grounds, we slowed our pace for seven hours at Great Faith. was nothing to rush toward. Midway across the yard, Christopher, John, and Little Man waved goodbye and headed for their class building. Stacy and I headed for the middle grades building that I had caught up with Stacy when he continuously liked to remind the world of how old he was getting certainly didn't please him. But lower grades or upper grades, they made no difference to me. I wasn't particular about any of them. 
At the steps of the building, Stacy joined Clarence and Little Willie, seeing only Mary Lou Wellever and Gracie Pearson from my own class, with whom to go while away the last minutes before the final bell. I went inside. As I entered the classroom, Sunboy Ellis and Maynard Wiggins were involved in a challenge, in tuss challenge of tussle against the tarpaulin curtain, which divided our class from the sixth graders next door. The two boys wrestled good-naturedly against the curtain to the pushings of invisible fingers and audible taunts on the other side. In the back of the room, Dubay Cross and several other teenage fifth graders glanced over absently waiting for class to begin. I joined the students who had gathered to watch the match, but just as some boy was about to force Maynard to the floor, the final bell started clanging and Mrs. Crandall walked in. The pandemonium fizzled to an end, and I scooted into the third row bench I shared with two other students. Mrs. Rent Crandall called the roll, then opened her history book. Another dismal school day had begun. Although school this year was no more exciting than my previous four years, it did at least offer one thing, a classroom free of Miss Daisy Crocker. Miss Crocker had reigned over my fourth grade class with a personality in direct contrast to my own, and a hickory stick which had more than once got its wear against my skin. This year, however, good fortune had smiled on me, and I had Mrs. Murtis Crandall, a rather shy but sweet lady. Despite the fact that her teaching style was no more exciting than Miss Crocker's, at least she didn't continually repeat herself about the same boring nothing, and she tended to be more sympathetic to my lapses into inattention. So, I was content. Today, as she presented the rudiments of the United States government to students whose major concerns were picking cotton and slopping hogs, the boredom of it all was suddenly broken by, rec by my recognition of a name she had just written on the blackboard. Pat Harrison and Theodore Bilbo, said Mrs. Crandall, turning to the class with a smile. Who can tell me who these men are, these two men are? I raised my hand. The name Bilbo had stuck with me. It was such a funny little name. Cassie? I stood promptly. I don't know who that Harrison fella is, but the other one is the governor of Mississippi. Miss Crandall smiled, pleased. Was, Cassie, was. He's our senator now, just elected last fall. And Pat Harrison is our other senator. You remember, every state has two. You know anything else about Senator Bilbo? I knew a lot about Bilbo now. Since I had first heard his name, Mama, Pop, and Big Ma had spoken of him several times. Well, I don't know all he done, but I bet you I know one thing. When that little rascal was governor... Miss Crandall's face abruptly changed. No longer smiling, she reprimanded me. Cassie, we do not refer to our senators as rascals. I frowned and then decided to rephrase. Well, that old devil, sit down, Cassie. An explosion of giggles erupted. It's not funny, and she's not funny, Mrs. Crandall declared, through what the wide grins and bright eyes from her students denied this. I want it silent this minute, and Cassie Logan, I'll see you after class. At noon, I remained seated as the other students noisily made their escape. When we were alone, Miss Crandall called me to her desk. Cassie, she said, I didn't think that was one bit funny in what you, what you did in class today. I stared blankly at her. I hadn't tried to be funny. You got a good mind, Cassie, but sometimes you say things you shouldn't. My papa said Bilbo was a devil, I blurted out, feeling that she had wronged me blad badly. Him and other folks say he ain't nothing but, de but a devil because of the way he do us and... That's enough now, Cassie, Miss Crandall's pale yellow face seemed suddenly drained. I don't want to hear what your pop and other folks are saying about the senator. I only care what goes on in this classroom, and I won't have any disrespect in here. You understand? Her voice had risen sharply. 
You leave your daddy's comments to yourself when you enter this room. I won't have you endangering my position with your mouth. I won't lose my job like your mother lost hers. You hear me? I didn't answer. You hear me? Yes, um, I mumbled, deciding that if I didn't like Miss Crandall, deciding that I did not like Miss Crandall so much after all. Can I go now? Miss Crandall nodded, avoiding my eyes, but as I reached the door, she stopped me. Cassie, she called. Ma'am? She stared at me apologetically. I wasn't going to make it easy for her. Nothing, she said finally, slumping back into her chair. Go on. Outside, Mary Lou Wellover, Alma Scott, and Gracie Pearson were waiting to taunt me. They laughed as I came down the steps. You get whipped again, Cassie? asked Mary Lou. I made no comment, just kept on walking. But that didn't satisfy Mary Lou, who seemed to think the fact that she was the principal's daughter gave her some sort of mysterious immunity from my fists. My daddy said the next time Cassie get in trouble, he gone back to teach us whipping with one of his own, he announced to Alma and Gracie. I stopped and looked from Mary Lou to Mr. Wellever, who was standing near his office talking with another teacher. He was a short, bespectacled, bespectacled man and didn't really look like much of a threat. Besides that, I had it from Stacy that compared to Papa's swing, Mr. Wellever's was absolutely nothing to fear. And if Mary Lou kept it up, I would gladly risk one of his whippings to flatten her. I looked again at Mary Lou and matched her smile with a slow, menacing one of my own. Hers quickly faded, and she backed away. Come on, y'all, she said, and with Alma and Gracie hurried off. I stared after them a moment, then scanned the yard, trying to decide where to eat my tin can lunch of eggs and oil sausages. I spied Henry Johnson and Maynard sitting on a stump by the road, eating and watching a group of older boys playing catch on the lawn. I went over and joined them. Standing nearby were Stacy, Little Willie, and Mo. As I sat down beside Maynard, Little Willie nodded toward a black Hudson coming east along the road. Look here, she said. Joe Billy Montier was in the car, but it was his friend Stuart Walker who was driving. Stewart's family owned a plantation on the other side of Strawberry and was co-owner along with Mr. Granger of the local cotton mill. Another young man, Pearson Wells, who worked for the Walkers, sat in the back. The car slowed and the three young men started talking to Alice Charles and J.C. Peters, two tenth grade girls standing near the road. Just look at him, hissed little Willie, his eyes hard on the car. I wish them scounds would come messing with one of my sisters. I'd beat them to a pull. Pearsons hollered something we could not hear, and the girls giggled. Then Stuart leaned out the window, and with a wide, wide grin, he said, Hey, come on down here a minute. Stuart was good-looking, and he knew it. Again, the girls giggled. Come on, you, the pretty one in the plaid. I got something to tell you. J.C., an attractive, perky girl, known for her daring, left Alice and started toward the car. But before she reached it, Miss Daisy Crocker came hurrying across the lawn with those giant strides of hers. You young gentlemen want something? She called, stopping J.C. Stuart kept grinning but shook his head. Then laughing, he accelerated the car, sped away, leaving a trail of dust in its wake. Miss Crocker, loudly abrading the two girls, led them back to the class buildings. Stacy, Moe, and Little Willie scowled after the car, then moodily moved out onto the lawn to play. I listened to the last echoes of Miss Crocker's mouth, glad that for once it wasn't me she was chewing out, and turned to my lunch. But before I could get the can open, some boy came running up from the road. Hey, Cassie, he hollered. My Aunt Leanne wants you. Me? What for? Some boy shrugged, ready to be off again. I think she wants you to write something for her. You better go on, cause she said she wanted you to do it for a school start up again. Then before I could ask him anything else, he was gone, heading over to a group playing a game of marbles. Since I couldn't join in the game anyway, I hurried onto the road with my lunch can in hand.
and I'm going to stop here for right now and we will pick back up next time until then may the Lord bless you and keep you may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace